Okay, I've started recording. Next thing is to make one there. So, Wanda is now the host. So, Wanda, there are a number of people in the waiting list. So, let's go. Law of banking and negotiable instruments, nature and legal effect of negotiable instruments. I will, I will say we'll take our presentations tomorrow. So, we are going to run and um, let's go. So, Today, we'll be learning about negotiable instruments. So one thing you ask yourself immediately we start is, what is a negotiable instrument? What does negotiating things mean? Okay. And um, there are a number of things I'm going to talk about. And I just realized that I normally give my students a particular textbook which is supposed to help them deal on forgery and everything, but I didn't do that. Um, if there's any of you that is around, you can come and pick this up and scan it. Otherwise, I'm gonna scan it tomorrow. I sent to you. So yeah, let's go. What is a negotiable instrument? So far, can somebody who has followed the class so far give me a breakdown of how what you've learned so far? I just want to pick your brains to know if you've been paying attention. Can someone do that? Um, good so, so far, um, please, can you hear me, guys? Okay. So far, um, we have discussed um, the history and um, nature and evolution of banking. Um, we talked about how banking, like how we did not know the precious time banking started and how merchants started um, bill of exchange, uh, exchange rather, and all of that, where the word um, banks come from, and where the word um, bankruptcy come from. Then um, after that, we talked about the revolution of banking in Nigeria um, from the colonial period up to the time of um, independence, where we had issues with regulations and um, where certain set of rules had to be put in place. Um, a typical example is the um, CBN Act of 19. 58, yeah, 1958, and subsequent regulations up to the Bufia Act and other regulations that might be put in place by the CBN governor. Um, we also discussed, okay, we discussed some of these um regulatory authorities and the principal authorities. The, princ the principal um act being CBN Act and the Bufia uh, makes provision for what um, banking businesses are, what a bank is in particular. That is, um, a bank must possess license before they can um, be a bank in Nigeria and must be registered under the Act. Um, then, so many other things. Other regulatory authorities um, involve the um, Bofia Act, the, uh, sorry, the NDIC rather, the um, um, Security and Exchange Commission, the Federal Ministry of Finance, and so far, the NDIC basically ensures um, um, deposit-taking institutions against their customers in case they go bankrupt and all of that. And they also come in place when... Um, sorry, am I still on, please? Yes, yes, carry on. 
okay and they also come in place in um situations whereby the um bank might go bankrupt that is the they save the bank basically and some of the other information uh, sorry some of the other functions include um reporting um bankers that were expelled due to great um gross misconduct and the likes and the most um pay customers um bank customers within 30 days of insolvency and all of that so um moving on we talked about um banker relationships um um the mat okay you defined bank um the definition was that um there is no specific definition for who a banker is in nigeria and the word bank and banker is being used inter interchangeably but what i deduced from that is that we can use um, the definition from the bufia act that is section 315 or 31 so i'm not sure that states that um the businesses of the business of banking includes the businesses of um receiving deposits on savings and savings and um current accounts paying checks being drawn and collecting checks being paid in and some other banking businesses function being um being um promulgated by the cbn governor in the federal gazette and all of that also you define um customers anyone who registers an account with um the bank um then you proceeded um, you proceed by um, talking about the nature of um banker customer relationship you talked about you talked about yeah i think that that's where i stopped okay sorry um you talked about um um what what is expected the duties of a customer that is um if there is an error on a particular account the customer is meant to report to the bank if there is um the, the, the customer has the responsibility of keeping his checks and every other thing um safe and if there is a compromise he should report to the bank immediately and also the function of the bank banker the banker cannot owe the account the, sorry the banker is not a trustee it is not a trustee relationship it is a fiduciary relationship and yes that's all i know about that so thank you so much that shows that at least one person was paying attention that shows one person was paying attention i'm really glad that you did a very good work so um Is there anybody else that wants to say anything? You know, what I'm doing now is I'm trying to make sure that you are, you are attentive to the lessons, your mind is in the lessons, you are not just switching on your Zoom and powering off, okay? You just leave it ringing somewhere and you are sweeping and cooking or doing whatever it is you want to do. So that's the idea for asking you what is really going on. Is there any of you, somebody, just one more person to add something, but please don't make it long. Summarize for me exactly what it is you've learned so far before I run. Anybody, just quick. If you if you want to do that, raise your hand so that the host can unmute you. Anyone else? Preferably female. Yes. Preferably female. Okay. If I don't have anybody, I'm going to run. Okay. Negotiable instruments is what we are talking about today. And um, Igwike defined negotiable instruments as a form of a chosen action with special characteristics. What is a chosen action? A chosen action is a form of ownership of something that is different from real property. Um, in law, we demarcate property into two, a chose and a, a, a real property. A chosen action is a form of ownership in something that is not physically gotten. Um, 
part of what is referred to as treaties in action is ownership of intellectual property um, things that you can own that you don't hold physically for example if i say i own a share in a bank there is no physical portion of the bank that i'm holding the bank is not a piece of animal meat that i have a leg or a a plot of land that i can say this is my exact share the idea of demarcating land into um uh, portions is not the same with when you are demarcating the shares the ownership portions of a company so a negotiable instrument is also a form of a chosen action because it shows that you own something but it's, it's not like you caught a piece of that thing and you are carrying it with you no it is only what you have is an evidence that you own something just like if for example you own an intellectual property what you actually have from the government is a license to the property so there is something that you have in your hand that tells you that you own this particular property that is what makes you feel like you own it it's not like you are carrying um who things fall apart now chino achebe is not busy carrying a piece of things fall apart whatever he's going to say this is my intellectual property this is my intellectual property no 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 what is happening is that he owns the right in the story of things fall apart okay okay so um if we case definition is spot on but he defines a negotiable instrument as a form of a choice that has special characteristics. And then he does a, a feature-based definition. He says, oh, if you want to know what a, cho um, a negotiable instrument is, you have to check this, 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 this. Investopedia, um, you are going to find it very useful for many of your legal research. It's an online investment encyclopedia. It has short entries on almost anything possible. You are going to find it really, really helpful. So it defines a negotiable instrument as a signed document that promises the sum of payment to a specified person or their signee. So in other words, a formalized type of IOU. Now, what is an IOU? An IOU is I owe you a, an undertaking that you owe somebody else. It's called an IOU. So but he's saying that a negotiable instrument is different from an ordinary IOU because it's a formalized type of IOU, a transferable, a transferable signed document that promises to pay the bearer a sum of money at a future date or on demand. The payee, who is the person receiving the payment, must be named or otherwise indicated on the instrument. So what he's saying here is a negotiable instrument is a document that is signed is transferable what does transferable means it means it can be handed over to another person literally okay by the time we see the examples of what a, a negotiable instrument is you are going to understand why being able to be handed over to another person is a fundamental requirement um it should be signed it should promise to give whoever is holding it. That's what is called a biara. A biara is the person that is literally bearing the negotiable instrument in his hand. The person carrying it in his hand is a biara. Or you can call it a holder. Okay. So we're going to look into all of these today. And by the time we finish, I expect you to have known everything that... Um... um everything that has to do with a negotiable instrument and you should be able to explain it to another person now there's a textbook i told you that i will recommend to you if you read from that textbook it traces the history of a negotiable instrument it defines it as a financial instrument that gives full legal title but why i'm not so excited about giving you this textbook is that many of you don't read anything you only read when you want to present, or you now read when the exams are coming up. Many of you don't care about what is going on. You just want to pass, you know. 
And you have to remove that perspective. I've told you, in banking law, the people who pass are the people who decide not to focus too much when it is exam period. You are carried along, you follow. This is a learning experience. It's not just for you to grab marks and run. That is not what I'm here for. There are other courses you can do that with. What I want you to do here is to learn. Carry yourself along with me. Many of you don't watch the YouTube videos. Okay, you watch the first one, but you, you are just not interested anymore. Change that character today, okay? Follow up what we are doing. Be interested in what we are doing. Want to know. Because if you don't make a first class, you know, it's only when you make a first class, you introduce yourself first you know, with your results. Whenever you enter a place, you're like, oh my, I'm a, I'm a graduate of AU first class, you know? <laughs> the only people who made first class are the people who introduced themselves like that. If you do not make a first class, what you know is really important. That's why you should go for knowledge, no. Because let me tell you the truth, a person who has a two one and knows a lot and also knows people, may go places where a person who does not know what he's supposed to do, but only has a first class can do. I'm just saying this as an aside before I delve into my distance. If I give you this note, if I waste my money, or rather spend my money to scan this note and give it to you, please read it. Please read it. Please go through it. It's really going to help you to understand. Okay. It's written not by a lawyer, so it's easy to understand. All right. So <clears throat> it talks about a, the definition of choices in action as how British merchants were always accepting payment instruments. That is to say, usually if you give somebody a negotiable instrument, right, you, you, you have a good in that person's if, let, let me explain this in a way that is easy for anybody to understand. If, for example, Clinton is trading with me and I buy goods from him and I want to pay him. However, I have a negotiable instrument with me, which is an evidence of the fact that I dropped gold with, let's say, Wanda, for example. I gave Wanda 50 pieces of gold and Wanda gave me a note saying, uh, Mr. Sop gave me 50 pieces of gold and I will give it to him whenever he presents this paper. You take that piece of paper from Wanda, I take it from Wanda and I buy a car from Clinton and I hand Clinton that piece of paper and I remove my name from there. I am owing Mr. Sop so so and so pieces of gold and I'll give it to him when he presents this piece of paper. I will now exchange Clinton's name. It will now be, I am owing Clinton and Labi so, so and so number of gold. And I'll give it to him when he presents so, so and so piece of paper. That is how a negotiable instrument is created. I have, uh, I have transferred my interest in a particular instrument to somebody in exchange for something. What is the benefit of that kind of transaction? I am unable to carry big watts of gold and be walking around in the street. Because if I did that, I would expose myself to risk. But the merchant that holds the gold and gives me a piece of paper safeguards it for me. Okay? So originally, British merchants, that is how they traded. You, they called those pieces of paper choices in action. That was a, a Lego jargon that explain the characteristic of assignment. Now, assignment refers to, I'm throwing some words here. Maybe in the next class, remind me, let me explain some of these words. But maybe those presenting can help us to do that. Assignment means that you are writing an inst a paper. You are evidencing in paper that you are transferring something to somebody. That's the meaning of an assignment. If you assign somebody, some of these things, you are going to learn it in detail next time, next semester by the grace of God. Okay. An assignment is when you write in a piece of paper, 
that I am giving so so and so this right over this property. That is why the document you use in reselling land is called a deed of assignment. You are not just giving a land, you are assigning your interest in that land to another person. Let's move on. <clears throat> now, the original merchants, British merchants who accepted payment through payment instructions or payment instruments endorsed to them for settlement of debts, call those instruments choices in action. I hope I'm not just dropping jargon. If you don't get what I'm saying, let me explain it. I've already talked about what an assignment is. I've talked about what delivery, um, biara, holder, all of these things. These are terms you'll get to know as parties to a negotiable instrument. Now, these, is, these um, merchants who used to accept these instructions to pay debt suddenly realized that giving notice was cumbersome in the sense that if you are going to assign something, you usually would have to go back to the original creator of that deed or of that instrument to tell him, okay, oh, you created this thing, but I'm handing it over to this person. You know, you have to get his consent before you divest of the interest in that property. However, that kind of thing, having to always get interest led to delays. Somebody cannot buy something immediately where he wants to buy it. He has to always walk back to his merchant to get his permission to transfer a property. Now, this led to an agreement that physical delivery sometimes accompanied with endorsement. Physical delivery means just handing over the piece of paper to another person. Endorsement means when you sign the particular bill of exchange or negotiable instrument will be enough. So these are merchants. Normally, they will give you a note evidencing that the fact that they have your property, maybe gold or some other precious metal. If you want to trade, that is, if you want to buy something else using that particular piece of paper they gave you, you have to return it to them and they will give their consent on the piece of paper. Because of that process was cumbersome, they now changed their minds and said, just handing over another person that piece of paper is enough to constitute valid transfer of title. Also, where the negotiable instrument would require you to sign your signature on it or make any form of endorsement, making that endorsement shows that you actually transferred that property. OK? However, as you may have figured out, if you were just thinking about it as I'm explaining it, you will realize that this kind of instrument where somebody will just go and hand over something will lead to some problems. What kind of problems will it lead to? There was a chances of forgery. Somebody could steal another person's um, uh, properties, okay? Somebody could steal another person's negotiable instrument. There could be delay in delivering the goods. And so somebody will say, oh, I'm not doing again. Give me back my negotiable instrument. But the person has cashed it. And one more thing is somebody who does not have a good title cannot transfer a good title to another person. What does a good title mean? If, for example, I buy land from a person who owns it, Usually, the best way of buying land is buying it from a person who inherited it as a beneficial owner. So I buy land from the original owner of the land. That land I bought has very good title. Nobody is coming to fight me over that property. Nobody has used the land for anything. It's just mine. I inherit a very good title. I inherit a defective title where somebody calls me is the first son of a of a man. The man is still alive. He has not died. He has not decided how to share his property. And the first son of a man that is still alive goes and sells to me their family land. The title is defective. It is defective in the sense that 
the father of that man can revoke the cell. He can say, oh, my son, I want to give you this land, though, but I won't give it to you again. If he says something like that, he can challenge my title because it was his son that sold the land to me. And that means that my title in the property, the ownership of that property that I have is not pure. There is still key leg inside. Now, it is possible to do that kind of thing with a negotiable instrument. If, for ex example, I drop gold with Clinton, who is a merchant, and I told him, oh, I've dropped this gold for you, but please, it's my brother's gold. And he gives me a receipt. Oh, I have this gold with this person. Do I have a fine title? No. The gold I dropped to him is not my own. It's my brother's gold. So I go into town. I buy something. I tell the person, oh, I have gold with this person. I negotiate my negotiable, negotiable instrument. I deliver it to that person. I hand it over. The person now comes to carry the gold that I've given him. And I say, the merchant says, oh, no, I can't give you this gold. Even though I've given an instrument evidencing that I have this property of this person with me, it is not his own because it belongs to his brother. That means that person does not have a pure title. He has gotten the title complete with the equities that come with it. Equities, what does equities mean? Equities mean there are things that accompany a title which make it not perfect in law. Those kind of things, if you are not a person who buys in good faith, if you are not a person who buys in good faith, if you are not a bona fide purchaser, you will inherit those equities together with your interest in the land. And that means, that means you will be unable to assert a perfect title over the property. I hope I've been making sense so far. I, I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Maybe it's too much. But if you have the textbook and you read it before we started, then you will not have so much problems understanding it. Or maybe by the time the presentation is done, please pay attention. Now, negotiability is the ability Negotiability is the ability to transfer the right in a property. When I say property now, I refer to a, an instrument. When I say instrument, I refer to a legal document that transfers rights. Instrument is not every legal document that is an instrument. An instrument is a legal document that is able to transfer rights. So negotiability refers to an ability to transfer rights from one person to the other. So let me talk about my next slide. My next slide talks about the features of negotiability, which is the features of a negotiable instrument or an instrument that can be negotiated. The first thing that is a feature of a negotiable instrument is that it is an instrument. Okay, that sounds really cliche because instrument is inside. But is it that simple? When you look at Igwe case textbook, I'm looking at it right here. Um, which, um, let me see, which, Hello, am I audible now? 
Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, if you look at this Zigwe case textbook, he explains these characteristics one by one in page 200. If you have it, you can open it. Let's look at it together. So um, an instrument he defines as a, any legal writing that is, an instrument is a writing and imports a document of a formal kind. Okay, it has also been defined as any written document under which any right or liability, whether legal or equitable, exists. So any, a negotiable instrument must be an instrument. That is to say, it must be a written document under which a right or liability, legal or equitable, must exist. Now, I'm sure you understand when you compare legal with equitable, you understand what that means for those of you who paid attention in your pool and in your legal system, you should be able to understand it. Another thing is that a negotiable instrument is a contract. That is, is a promise in writing to secure the payment of money or the delivery of security for money. So the instrument itself is the contract and it doesn't, sh the instrument, a negotiable instrument is not telling you that there will be a contract. It's not promising you that, oh, we are going to make a contract in the future. No, it is a contract itself. Another thing is that it is negotiable. What does that mean? If you, trans, if you hand it over to another person, if you just carry a negotiable instrument and give another person by hand like that, you have transferred title, even if it is equitable. And it's possible for an instrument that can be negotiated to hand it over just by giving somebody the stuff by hand. There is no need for a transferee to give notice to the original owner before further negotiation. So if you are somebody that have received a negotiable instrument, you don't need to walk back to the original owner and say, oh, I need your permission before I give this to another person. No, 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 you can go, go ahead and negotiate it. A bona fide transferee for value takes the title in the negotiable instrument free of any equities. What does this last statement mean? It means that if you are able to be a transferee, transferee is somebody that something has been transferred to. So, in the spirit of contract, you just finished contract now. So I'm sure you know a lot about offeror, offeree, transferor, transferee, lessor, lessee, mortgageor, mortgagee. So when we say transferee, you already know we are referring to the person who the instrument is handed to. If I make a document to Clinton, Clinton is the transferee. I am the transferor or transferer. Well, law says raw. So, so if Clinton pays me money and collects that negotiable instrument from me free of any equities, that is, he's not aware that, for example, there is a defective title. Clinton cannot be forced to part with that and uh, this thing. He gets a totally, totally, totally clean title. So what are the benefits of being able to negotiate an instrument? You know, it's a feature of a negotiable instrument. So what are the benefits? One, a transferee who has met all the conditions of negotiability can have a title superior to the title of the transferor. A transferee can sue in his own name any person liable on the bill. A notice need not be given to the person liable to pay the bill in order to register it as the holder's property. There is ease of transfer of title. Let me explain this. Let me give you an example of a negotiable instrument because I'm sure you people have been trying to know. Um, maybe you will get there. So this is a quasi-negotiable instrument. What does quasi-negotiable instrument mean? Quasi-negotiable instrument refer to things that look like 
a negotiable instrument, but is not. For example, a bill of lading, a share certificate, an IOU, postal and money order. So some of you had have known how to do drop, sh drop shipping, may know what a bill of lading is. What is a bill of lading? A bill of lading is a document that is used in a bill of lading or lading, whatever. It's used in shipping things. If you order something, let's say you are an importer and exporter, okay? You are an importer and exporter, and you order a container from China. You're a Nigerian, you travel to China to import something. So you, the person you are buying the goods from will give you a particular um, bill, a document called a bill of lad, a, a negotiable and a non-negotiable bill of lad. Then he takes an exact counterpart of that document he has given to you and gives to the shipper, the shipping company or the agent, his agent that will go and ship the instrument. So the shipping company has a, 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 a look-alike of what you have. You travel home, you know, via flight with your own copy. When the goods come into Nigeria, you carry your own copy of the bill of lading and go to the port. You present it and your goods are cleared out for you. Anybody that brings that bill of lading complete with a signature, can carry the goods. Are we paying attention? Anybody that comes with a complete um, nature of a bill of lading, he can take your good. But now it will be difficult because they are, you have to present forms of identification. But even if the person can forge your identity, he's going to take the bill. But does that make a bill of lading a negotiable instrument? No. Why? Because it doesn't fulfill the conditions, which is that somebody that is transferred to cannot have a better title and other things of that nature. Another thing that looks like a negotiable instrument is a share certificate. You can transfer your shares from another person. That's why people sell shares. You can sell shares and give your share certificate to that other person. But that does not mean that the share that you've sold to another person transforms the share certificate into a negotiable instrument. It's not a negotiable instrument. Um, <clears throat> somebody is saying, is way bill a negotiable instrument? That is the document you are giving. It looks like a negotiable instrument, but it's not. All you have to do is you have to look at these conditions that we have listed here. These features, is it an instrument? Is it a contract? Is it negotiable? Can a person who gets that title free of charge in a place where it's properly traded be able to have a better title than the person who handed it over to him? That's what you have to ask yourself. So let's go on. A postal and money order. So let me just jump straight to what are negotiable instruments. A check, a treasury bill, a traveler's check, a banker's draft, a share warrant, a dividend warrant, a bearer debenture. Now, many of these things you may not know it, but you may know a draft because when you pay your law school fees, it's going to, you are going to use a draft to pay your law school fees. But I'm sure everybody knows check. But then let me even not use these examples that look like it is old school. Let me use an example. I'm going to come back to this, but let me use an example that all of you know about, which is banknotes. You can see banknotes. What is an example of a banknote? Can someone tell me? What is an example of a banknote? Mm. 
one negotiable instrument that everybody knows about. Somebody tell me. Hello. Someone raise your hand and tell me. You don't know what a banknote is? If you guys. Okay, go ahead. Banknote is a uh, is like money bill a note like a naira note a dollar note exactly so that's correct see if you can see your screen now you can see the head of the queen you know imagine all your life your head will never be on your currency okay my god the queen the queen literally has her face on money now that, that's something. You go go figure. So look at the, the banknote in the UK. This is 50 pounds. The currency issued in the name of the Queen. So this is some dude. Is this a Benjamin? So this is Benjamin Franklin, a hundred dollars. So also so that you can be you can be used to this kind of money. <laughs> I know you ask yourself, why is it that the dollar, the naira is not here? Now, the point is there is no Nigerian currency that equals this to 50 pounds is almost 35,000 Naira now. And 100 pounds is almost 70,000. So, <laughs> yeah, so you are using correct currency. That does not mean that our Naira doesn't have value. No, just that the value is lesser. So this is an example of a bill of exchange. So let me ask you, can you negotiate a banknote? If, for example, you do something for somebody, let's say you render a service, the person pays you, how would the person pay you? Is it not in currency? Why do you trust that money that person is giving you? You trust that banknote because it has value. It means that if you go to a bank and deposit it, you have 50 Naira. 50 Naira is not something that you can grab with your hand or something. 50 Naira is an idea that you are worth 50 Naira. Because there was a time they were selling a car for 1,000 Naira. That's the idea in your head. Oh, I'm worth 1,000 Naira. It has become complicated and there are economies built around you, but this is all in your head. That note you have in your hand is evidence that you are worth so, so, and so amount of money. So that thing you do for somebody in two or three days, and the person gives you this amount of money, that amount of money expresses how much the person feels like you are worth. So that note they gave you constitutes a, a negotiable instrument. Now, pay attention. Imagine you are giving this note now. Let's say a 1,000 Naira note for, um, let's say, what can you do? You typed something for somebody. You gave, typed a one-page document for somebody and the person gave you 1,000 Naira. Now, do you know it's possible that that 1,000 Naira can be fake, fake currency? If it's fake, what can you do? It means that the value it has, it doesn't have it. So what can you do? You can sue the person because by giving you that money, he, by agreeing on that money and him giving you what you are worth, he has, he has, he has negotiated the value which you can go back to sue him for if that banknote is fake. Another thing is, do you know that that person that is paying you 1,000 Naira may have stolen the money? You may have stolen the money, but you did something for him. You carried him on, on a bike. You typed something for him, and he paid you your due. Does he mean that the fact that he stole the money means somebody will now see you and say, ah, you collected money from a thief, return it. No, you exchange value 
for the notes you have in your hand. You give the person value. You are a bona fide holder for value. Look at this characteristic here. You are a bona fide transferee for value. So that 100, 1,000 Naira you have with you, you have a better title, you have a better claim to that 1,000 than the person who gave you that 1,000. So if the police catch that thief and, or, and he sued for thought, and the thought says you must return the money you stole from somebody or let's use thought of deception where somebody is suing somebody for money had and received. Okay, you deceive somebody, they parted to their money, they announce suing you. Do you know that he's returning the money does not mean that he's going to come to you and collect the bank notes that he gave to you? He cannot do it because even though he's a thief and the people he stole from are demanding his money from their money from him, he cannot come to you that gave him value and force you to return what you're giving him. Take, for example, a very recent example, Hush Puppy. Everybody knows that Hush Puppy was buying Ferraris, was buying these, was buying that. Nobody is going to Ferrari to say, why did you take money from a thief when you know the money is not his own? It's none of their business. They negotiated value to somebody. The person paid them in cash. They gave him something. They have a better title to that money than Hush Puppy has. That is the thing about negotiable instruments. It's possible that when it is carried on in the normal course of business and the person pays value for it, it's possible for that person's title over that negotiable instrument to be superior to the title of the transferor. No caps. So yeah, let's go to laws that govern negotiable instruments. <clears throat> now, look at this. Normally, what governs negotiable instrument is what is referred to as the Les Macantoria. Now, what is a Les Macantoria? A Les Macantoria is the custom of merchants the way that merchants behave, okay? How do merchants behave? There are, every trade has a way that people who ply the trade behave. If you want to go to Fajui now in Ife, everybody knows that a, a bus cannot carry you to Fajui. Is there anything wrong with the road in Fajui? No. But why? The normal custom for bus drivers in Ife is to take this uh, long road from Campus Gate all the way to Oba and or Ife City and turn back. But if you want a car to take you to Fajui, you have to pay special money to carry you inside. Now, imagine you are somebody who has never come to Ife before and you are in, let's say, Mayfair. And you see somebody and you say, Fadri, Fadri, you see a, a boss, he's shouting Fadri, Fadri. You enter and you relax, you put your earpiece, you are listening to um, Omale's song, or for some of you who are good people. Good people. You are listening to Law of Banking on YouTube for the good students. Now, now we now reach somewhere. They say, this is Fadri's junction. Everybody going to Fadri, drop here. And you're like, no, 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 no. We agreed we are going to Fadri. I am going to number 25 Fadri Road. Driver, you have to drop me there. You have a right in what you are saying. You are making sense. What did you agree? Fadri, where did you think you are going? Fadri. Where did the bus driver drop you? Fadri too. So when you now start shouting, oh, no, no, no. You can't tell me that. People will say, ah, no, no, no. Buses cannot carry you into Fadri. They will drop you at the junction. That is the custom. 
when you keep shouting, I know somebody like Clinton will start saying, do you know who I am? I'm a lawyer. He's not a lawyer, but he's already boasted. I'm a lawyer. I will show you. I will sue you. They say, Baba, even if you sue us from now to tomorrow, Faju Yi is this junction. We not go carry inside. Next question people will ask you, did you chatter this boss? Say, oh my God, what is chatter? Did he say I should chatter him? What was he saying? Was he not Faju Yi? That is an example of what a custom of a merchant is. People who do this business already understand how they move. Let me give you an example. There was a time I wanted to buy tomatoes from the north to sell in the east where I live. And um, when I went to buy tomatoes, I went to the woman who sell tomatoes in the market. And I'm like, I have tomatoes I want to sell you. They said they will not buy from me. I said, any amount they are selling to you in the market by the normal people, I will say to you, they said, no, they won't buy from me. They won't buy from me. Even if they'll buy from me, I'll have to keep it in my house and they will come to my house and carry it. I cannot bring my, uh, tomatoes to them. So what did I find out? I find out that the way they sell tomatoes is this. Somebody enters with his goods. Let's say you go to just to get a container of tomatoes, a trailer of tomatoes. They land in wherever, Oka, for example. In the Oka tomato market, there are people who are sitting there that their job is to sell tomato. They are not the people that bring the tomatoes. So once the owner comes down with his tomatoes, the owner goes, goes back home to bath and eat. Those people that sell tomatoes take over. They sell to the buyers. The buyers already know that they are not the owners of the tomatoes, but they are the people that sell. Now, if you are a, a, rook, a rookie person there, say, ah, this seller is my friend now. He will give me back in. The seller says, oh, I know you, you are my friend, but I'm not the one selling. You now will go and be shouting, wicked friend. You know, but your friend cannot sell tomatoes to you because the custom of the trade is that there are people sitting in the market that sell those things. Let me even tell you something else. If an owner comes down and wants to sell by himself, nobody will buy from him. That is the custom of the market. I'll give you one last story before. This is just to illustrate this lesson because Many students are confused about this negotiable instrument and we have to take it over and over. And this is why I said, I was discussing with Clinton that one class is usually not enough to deal with this because it's really large. Now, there was a young man that is a church person, is a Christian, he goes to church. And he's um, part of these people that sell things in the market. In Nibo land, we call them Undo Sahe. That is, if you enter a market, let's say where they sell shoes or clothes, there are people that meet you and want you to come and buy something. They don't own any shop. But if you follow any of them, they will take you to a shop and sell something to you like they own the shop. But they don't own it. The owner may be there sitting down. He won't even care what you people are discussing. Now, there was a young man like that, and he was sitting down in a market one day. He couldn't get anything to sell. On Sunday, the next day was a Sunday, he went to church. The pastor was raising money, a million naira. Say, if you will give this church a million naira, come out. This man that didn't have any shop in the market came out. When he came out, the pastor said, ah, Young man, you don't have any shop. We are raising one million. Can you give one million? He said, what? One million? I didn't even hear. I'm sorry. He said he was running back. The pastor said, come, come, my son, come. I will pray for you. God will give you a million naira. And the pastor prayed for him. Some of you don't believe in prayer or whatever. That's also okay. But Shad know that the pastor prayed for him. Now he went back to his market 
that he was selling. He went back. The next day, somebody came in from Kotonu. This is happening in Alaba market. And the person who thought, told us this story was a professor that taught us arbitration. But that's not the issue here. He went to Alaba market and a man met him. One of the persons that sell have big shops in Alaba market. He had imported three containers of a piece of clothing or no, a, some parts of sockets that were not in use in Nigeria. You see Nigerian sockets are 220 volts. He imported sockets he didn't know. Three containers of sockets. So he called the guy and said, can you run these three, so these three containers for me? The man said, yes, I can run it for you. I can sell everything inside. He said, okay, if you can sell it, I'll give you one, one million on top of each of them. Of course, it's impossible for one person to sell everything inside a socket. One day, a person from Kotonou came into that market. Kotonou is colonized by the French, so they use a separate set of sockets than Nigerians. And he wanted the specific kind of socket that this man had. When people crowded such a big buyer, many of them who crowded him did not have the containers that he wanted until this man came along. And he asked the owner, the person from Kotonu, how much of these sockets do you want? He said, I need a lot. He said, follow me. He took him to those containers, three containers. The buyer from Kotonu said he would take the three of them. And each socket was supposed to be sold for like 40, 40 naira a piece. He added 100 naira on top and sold one particular piece for 140. Now, when you multiply that with the amount of sockets that were in one container, the sockets, the, each container that was worth 3 million, he was making 6 million from each of them. You know, he was making so much money as gain that even the owner of the containers himself was angry because the owner of the container that put it at 3 million. Remember that his cost price is inside. But this person that is selling for an extra 6 million, all that he's making is gain. Because all he has to do is to carry the 3 million of the owner of the container and hand to him. He has made his money. That was how he did that sale. Gave the owner of the container 9 million. Took 9 million went back to church on Saturday. One week never passed. Oh. When the pastor saw him drop a check of one million, the pastor nearly fainted. Pastor himself did not believe in the prayer <laughs> he has made. But that is to show you, I'm just telling you this story to illustrate the fact that if you that don't know how the business is done, hear this story, that somebody sold somebody else's goods, and made more gain than that person, you say, oh my God, this is wrong. Somebody is being cheated here. I will not stand for it. But people in that business understand that that is how the business is done. So that is exactly what the less mercantoria means. It is the conduct of merchants. It crystallized into English common law. Some of them were adopted into Nigeria as part of received English law. Those are part of what governs negotiable instruments in Nigeria in line with other forms of specific legislations targeted at specific negotiable instruments. For example, the Bill of Exchange Act. Let's move on. Examples of negotiable instruments. <clears throat> One of them is a bill of exchange. What is a bill of exchange? A bill of exchange is an unconditional order in writing addressed by one person to another, signed by the person giving it, requiring the person to whom it is addressed to pay on demand or at a fixed or determinable future time a sum certain in money to 
or to the order of a specified person. So a bill of exchange is a particular unconditional order in writing. What is unconditional order? Some of you who your brothers are in admissions abroad, they give them conditional admission. That is, you must do this and that before your admission is full. You know, an unconditional order in writing is an order that is given to you without putting a condition for you to fulfill. So a person who writes a bill of exchange makes an unconditional order. He signs it saying that whoever I'm giving this bill of exchange will be paid whenever he wants a particular amount of money or a sum certain in money to himself or to his order. That is to say, if he doesn't want to take this money, you are writing a bill of exchange, you are saying, I'm going to give you that will bring this bill in the future. Mr. Meko Okori, I will give you 1 million naira whenever you want it or to whomever you order me to give it to. That is what is a bill of exchange. A check, nearly the same thing, but it's addressed by one person to a banker, signed by the person giving it, requiring the banker to pay on demand a sum, certain in money, to or to the order of a specified person or bearer. So let me ask you, what is the difference between these both? You can, bill of exchange can be an order made to somebody that is not a bank. A check can only be made to a person who is a bank. The banker must give to the person who appears with a checkbook. The amount specified in that checkbook, it is given on demand. That is to say, when I come there and say, I need this money, you give it to that person immediately. We are going to deal with this fully. Bills of exchange, you will deal with it fully in your second semester. A check, there is a topic, checks and their crossings. So stay tuned for that check lecture. But what you need to know about this is, both of these things are negotiable instruments. Both of them have the characteristics of negotiability. And both of them can be assigned or transferred. And when somebody gets a bill of exchange or a check in the normal course of business, free of equities, he can have a better title than the person who has given it to him. A promissory note is a financial instrument that contains a written promise by one party. The person who makes the note to pay another party pay ye a definite sum of money on demand or at a specified future date. So a promissory note, right, is when someone promises to pay money to a person in the future, whenever the person demands it or a specific future date. Now, many of us may not even come to um, face any of these bills of exchange. But if, for example, you were a student in a developed country, you are going to pay your fees through a promissory note. Government will normally give you what are called student loans. That is money to pay your school fees that you have to pay over a period of time. Government gives you a number. So over the course of your working years, you'll be paying this debt to the government little by little. That is what a promissory note refers to. A banknote, we've talked about it. A banknote is a negotiable promissory note which one party can use to pay another a specific amount of money. A banknote is payable to the bearer on demand and the amount payable is apparent on the face of the note. I have not gone into details. Each of these negotiable instruments have a long history behind it. They have a lot of things to say about them. Um, if, for example, we are going to have another lecture, maybe I'll do it with them in full, but take notice that negotiable instruments is a topic you are going to come across again in your second semester, and it will be dealt with 
in more detail then. Okay, we are going to be talking about the parties to a bill, who is a holder for value, and many things of that sort. So until then, I'm going to stop my class now and take questions. Is there any question? Any question? Oh, good. No question. That shows you guys really understood something. Everything. Now, the group presenting on tomorrow, eh, I feel like you should address me on what is the effect of fraud on a negotiable instrument. Remind me tomorrow, wonder, what is the effect of fraud on a negotiable instrument? Okay, so yeah, now that you've understood what a negotiable instrument is, I think it's fair enough for us to summarize our lessons here today. So I want to thank you for your time. Um, I'm sorry for the slight shift in what we are doing, but um, this period is not easy for anyone. So I will see you tomorrow on Google Meet by 6 p.m. Thank you.